What's up, man? Uh, what's up, man?
Refuge fell me, O man, carried my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art refuge, and my portion in the land of living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, but thou shalt guilt bountifully, bountifully with me. And the Lord is always with the soul of Amen. 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 May we pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Father. Blessed Sunday. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for your favor and blessing. And everything that you have done for us over the week, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us strength and keep carrying on in your name. Yes, Lord. Lord, bless us all. Give us all your grace, your glory. Amen.
Good morning, my wife the Davis uh, church family and friends. Good morning. Uh, God is good. Yes. Uh, God. All the time. All the time. Yes. Amen. Uh, Reverend Jones, the first lady, and our Martha Davis church family want to welcome our special guest, Chief of Police in Charlotte, North Carolina, Brother John Jennings. I'm Mayor Fox. Amen. 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 And all our law enforcement officers. Amen. Amen. We thank God and all of you for your service. Also, we want to memorize our fallen police officers and the families all over the world. Yes. Well, well, and uh, please make yourselves at home and enjoy our service. Again, we say welcome. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. We also want to welcome Dr. Warren Stenson for being here this morning. Amen. We also want to welcome the, uh, the speaker of the hour and his wife and family for being here this morning. At this time we will have, before we have the introduction of the speaker, we will take up our offering. We still want to have it. It's giving time here in Martha Davis. The Lord has been good to us and we know that we will be good to you. Amen. Eternal Father, we come this morning giving you all honor, glory, and praise. Thanking you, dear Heavenly Father, for our rising up this morning and us being in the house of the Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all church doors that open in your name. And we thank you that you always have the doors here in Martha Davis open. Yes. And we say, Lord, thank you for everyone as well. Now, dear Heavenly Father, as we come to take up these tithes and these offerings, we know that, dear Heavenly Father, that all of these gifts come from you. Yeah. And we ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you open up the windows of heaven, that we may, while you pour out your blessings upon us, we can pour out our blessings upon you. Yeah. Bless those who have it to give, those who do not have it to give. Dear Heavenly Father, you know that they give of themselves, mm -hmm. and they come to you in their own special way. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you always listen. Yes, now, dear Heavenly Father, as we close this prayer, we ask that you continue to bless this church, mm -hmm. bless the Martha Davis church family, mm -hmm. and we'll give you all the honor, give you all the glory, and Lord, we certainly give you all of the praise. Yes, In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.
for the speaker that's coming. Yes. Yeah. We're going to yeah. give honor to his wife. Would you stand, please? I'm 
second to the back pew back there trying to keep each other awake during church service. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was a great honor to have my elderly brother Jarvis in the same <laughs>
at one point I, I had committed to say that I was going to go to North Carolina State and play. Mm -hmm. And I told my high school coach, Craig Kisabeth at the time, that I'm going to go to NC State. And he said, let's why don't you come back at the end of the day and we'll make the phone call together to tell the coaches. And so we got around the school and everybody's joking or they're not joking. Everybody's coming up to me. You're going to be a wolf pack. You're going to go to NC State. And it almost scared me to the point where I said, well, let's slow this down a little bit. And by the end of that day, I changed my mind. And I said, Coach, let me give it some more thought. Let me give it a few more days to think about it. And by the, it's a long story, but towards the uh, couple of days later, Appalachian State, one of my best friends for since third grade, Mark Moore, was going to commit to Appalachian State University. So uh, Mark committed to Appalachian State, and Appalachian State called me and said, hey, we want you to play inside linebacker, because I was a defensive end in, in high school. And I said, you know what, Coach? I want to go ahead and commit. And I just felt, it just felt right. Mm -hmm. And as I go on, I said, Appalachian State was where I was supposed to be. Just like right here, right now, is where I'm supposed to be. Amen. Amen. So Appalachian State was something that I truly, I mean, I, to this day, if you look at my office, it's full of black and gold. That state <laughs> and then so after I graduated, I didn't really have a direction. You know, it, it's just tough when you're playing sports to really kind of focus on what you want to do afterwards. After I graduated, I moved to Charlotte without a job. And I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I, I ended up getting a job working in group homes for young kids who were troubled. And as I saw the struggles that some of these kids went through, and people always talked about how bad these kids were, and I said, if you look at their lives, you're lucky they're not worse. Amen. Yes, amen. If you look at what they've had to go through, some of their adverse experiences that they've had to go through, and you look and see that they didn't know what they were doing and things that they were involved in was bad. And it was tough. That was a tough job. But it was where I was supposed to be at that time. And eventually, I had a friend that I did play for football with that said, hey, the, the police department's hiring. Let's go and uh, let's go and apply. And I looked at him like he was crazy. <laughs> said, hey, no way, I'm not I'm gonna be a cop. That's not a <laughs> and so I, I was uh, I resisted that, but I said, you know what? Let's go ahead and do it. Because I said it took a lot of times that I heard people say it took two years to even get on the force after you apply. And so I applied, and three months later, in my love, I started getting phone calls about becoming a police officer with the Charlotte Police, back then just the Charlotte Police Department. And the more I looked into it, the more I felt like it was a calling for me, something that I wanted to do. And so I applied, I went ahead and accepted the job, and I'll never forget calling my mom and telling her that I just accepted a job to become a police officer. And I could just feel her, feel what she was thinking, it's the worry that she had. She said, oh, Lord, are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> and I said, Mom, I'm going to get the best training. I'm going to get, uh, it's going to be a while before I even get cut loose. And I, I tried to do everything I could to make sure that she was at ease with my decision. But that decision was where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And throughout the years, uh, I, like, like you heard Deacon Langston talk about, some of the, uh, the things that I've been able to accomplish, the things I've been able to see, the places I've been able to go, the people that I've met. And we were talking that just, just last week, I'm sitting in the room with the President of the United States talking about crime. And the President's coming to Charlotte in just a few weeks. And just to be able to have that opportunity, I've met Presidents, I've met movie stars, I've met musicians, I've met so many people that have been able to, that have been so influential in our country and in all of our lives that the police department, had I not been a police officer, I would not have those opportunities. And it's an admirable and noble profession. And somehow we have lost that along the way through other people. 
Mm -hmm. And if you look, so as I move forward in my story, in 2019, I was eligible to retire from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. And I had a phone call that they wanted me to uh, come down to Greenville, South Carolina, because there's a police chief's job open in Greenville, South Carolina. And so I entertained that and went down there and ended up getting an offer to be the chief of police in Greenville, South Carolina. Well, then I called my city manager. My city manager said, hold, chief, wait a minute. Charlotte's open. And I was in that process. And he said, let me finish this process before you make that decision. And I said, certainly. Not knowing what was going to end up happening. Then I ended up having offered from Charlotte and from Greenville. Now the decision had to be made. So I went to the boss. There he goes. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the boss. And I said, we, we, did, we had to make that decision. A lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. A lot of discussion. You know, uh, my wife has given me three beautiful, wonderful kids. Three sons. They're all grown now. 26 and twins that are 23. Mm. And so we, we made this a family decision to say, where, do we, where am I supposed to be in 20, coming up in 2020? We took the job with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, a department that I spent the last 30 years in. I've been there 32 years now. And I realized that Charlotte is where I'm supposed to be. Charlotte is where I belong to be the police chief. And it was amazing to see that in, I was announced as the next police chief. And I was told, my, or my thought was, I have to have a plan. What is my vision for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Chief? And I said, we have had some great police chiefs over the past several years. And I want to be able to fit, realize how can I continue those legacies, and how can I continue the great work that they've done within the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department? Mm -hmm. And then this little thing that you might remember happened with George Floyd mm -hmm. and Derek Chauvin. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell my people, that everything you do, and I tell every law enforcement officer, that everything you do and your interaction with the public is much bigger than you. It's much bigger than just your department. It has to do with the entire law enforcement community and how we are perceived and how we are accepted by the general public. And we can have six million contacts with individuals every single year within law enforcement. And it only takes one. It only takes one that gets around that tarnishes what we wear right here over our, over our heart. One bad police officer. And that's tough. So I go to bed at night not just worrying about what my people are going to do. I have to worry about what an officer in California is going to do. Mm -hmm. I have to worry about what an officer in Memphis is going to do. Mm -hmm. I have to worry about what an officer in Texas is going to do. Because that's what we, that's what we do in law enforcement is because we, are, we have such great authority that's given by each and every one of you. The people give us the power to police, and the people should have a say in that. And that's one of my pillars within the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department when I talk about community collaboration. But it's a tough profession that people have to realize. We can have an incident where you're pulling a, a family out of a burning building. It's going to get a one day of loose cover. But you get a you get a, a footage of a bad use of force. It's going to be in the news for weeks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we say, well, is that unfair? But then we have to stop and think about the authority that we have as law enforcement and the power that we have. So there's got to be a greater and higher accountability on that. And we have to accept that when we join this profession. But as I continued on and I realized that I have to change how we perceive within the Charlotte Mecklenburg, how we are perceived within the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, and we have to be able to look back 
and see where are some things that we have failed in the past and where do we want to go as an agency. And I said, we have to make sure that we have a collaboration with the community, that we continue to manage crime, and that we continue to also work on employee wellness. Because if we can't take care of ourselves, then we can't take care of our community. Mm -hmm. If we're not right up here, then we're not going to do right by you and be right out there. Well, right. And I think that's important. And we have really kind of moved forward to take away that stigma to say, I need help. I need help that I can't do this by myself. I need someone to help me get through this. We see and do things that the average human being should never have to experience in their lifetime. And that's a tough ask. That is a tough ask for a profession. Because let me tell you, you're not going to get rich. You're not going to get rich being a police officer. Amen. But it's a duty to serve and a duty to call, a, a calling that you have to be able to help other people and to get satisfaction out of the job every single day. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. As much as I resisted saying that I wanted to be a police officer, I would not go, I would do it again. Um, so as I continue to look at how do I move forward within the Charlotte Police, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, I had to take that in consideration of what we had just gone through. George Floyd was a terrible incident. It was, we, they call it what it is, it was a murder. It was a police officer murdering a citizen. Yes. Right? There's not a police officer I know that looks at that and says that was okay. But we had to overcome that and to get, build that trust back within the community. As we dealt with that, we also dealt with defunding the police and taking away certain, uh, uh, certain things that the police needed to be able to reduce crime. In some of those cities, and I praise Charlotte every single day because Charlotte went down that path, started going down that path. We pumped the brakes. We said, whoa, wait a minute. We want to be a world-class city. Charlotte is, for those who don't know, Charlotte is the 15th largest city in the country. Mm -hmm. And the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department is the 17th largest police department in the country. And we had to set the example. We have the home of the Charlotte Hornets, NBA basketball team, the Carolina Panthers, mm -hmm. the NFL football team. We now have Charlotte FC, Major League Soccer, professional team. We have the Charlotte Knights, baseball team, minor league baseball team, all of this within our uptown. As you mentioned, some of the events that we have, the NBA All-Star Games, the, the Billy Graham funeral was, was really huge. Yes. We're, we're one of the very few cities in the country that have ever had the, the city president and the city vice president in the same city at the same time. And that's a huge responsibility, and that burden Really, a lot of that fell on my shoulders in the planning and operations on that. So the responsibilities that we have to keep our community safe is huge. No one thinks about us when we're when everything's going great, right? No one thinks about the police department when things are going in line and things are going as planned. But when things go crazy, what's the first thing we look at? And I don't know about here, but when I turn on the news in Charlotte, if it wasn't for crime and police and all that, they would have no business. Right. That's because true. that's all they want to talk about. Yeah. And it's sad, it saddens me because there's more to what we do as human beings every single day than someone getting murdered. Amen. Or Amen. someone <coughs> robbing someone else. Amen. There's so much good things and we thrive as a community to say, this is the information that I want. This is my entertainment. Chaos is my entertainment. Yeah. And I hate that. Yeah. I look at that every single day and I say, why do I, I know there's so many good things? We try to feed positive stories to our media every single day and they don't want that. But let them have some sort of controversy within law enforcement or the community. Let them have something that's going to shock and awe people. They're all over. And it's about their demand. 
But I go back to talking about defunding the police and and how we how we were able to pump the brakes in Charlotte. And now as I look at what do you hear about in these other cities that defunded their police department? And you see how they're scrambling now to get that money back. They're scrambling to reinforce their agencies. When you have a police department that has a 40% vacancy, wow, that's a problem. When you have people that are not able to protect and serve your community, that's a problem. When you have 12 and 13 year olds killing each other, that's a problem. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm, I'm passionate about right now, we, we have to protect our young people. Amen. And as we look forward, and we, you know, Charlotte, uh, a few years ago, I, I, I've actually been on national news talking about this. We raised the age of an adult child from, or, or, I'm sorry, as an adult offender from 16 to 18. Nothing wrong with that. I don't object to that. But what we didn't do was to account for the resources that were necessary to ensure that we could accommodate the influx of juvenile crime. So what we've seen is not only adding 16 and 17 year olds into juvenile crime, we've also seen more and more kids committing violent crimes within our community. And where have we failed protecting our young people? It does them no good. To, it does no good to anyone to arrest a 17-year-old child for stealing 40 cars, and then all we are able to do is release that that child back to their parent or guardian, putting them right back into that same environment with no programs or no systems to make sure that they don't recidivate, they don't go back into the system again. And as I've said many times, we are failing our young people. It's not about just say, let's lock them up. Let's put them in a cell and forget about it. It's much more than that. When I say let's, let's do that for certain people, there has to be some programs and some accountability that we make sure that we get our young people back on track. And that's so important to me because I'm passionate about that because of my history of work and working in those group homes and seeing uh, seeing what the exposure some of these kids have had. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we have to make sure that we look after them. We need the young people to come back to the church. Amen. 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 We need to put the church back Amen. into the school. Amen. 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 get them back to where they realize, like I grew up, to say we have a certain respect for one another, and we have to treat each other a lot better than we're treating each other. So, I talk about the path that we're on, but I see so many great young people that are doing so many great things, but what I, again, when I turn on the news, I hear about a 14-year-old walking around with a gun and shooting another kid. And that's what makes me sad in my profession. But we have a long way to go. <coughs> but I will tell you that as the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And today I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be talking with you. Amen. 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 It's such an honor to be here and serve, serving as the police chief and to come back full circle now in a church that I remember being a young kid sitting right back there in those pews. But let's think about where we're going as a country. And if you if you see a police officer, make sure you thank that officer. Make sure you thank them for what they do. I don't know what kind of reaction what kind of reaction you're going to get, but I tell people all the time with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, you may not get a reaction right then. I guarantee you that officer is going to go home and remember the fact that someone thanked me for my job today. Someone appreciated what I do today. And that is such a blessing when you start looking at, at what we do every single day. People notice. As I tell my people all the time in the police department, 
is you have one person that will criticize and hate what you do mm -hmm. and feel like you're, that will vilify your profession. But for every one of those people, there's a thousand who appreciate what you do. There's a thousand that will say, your job is honorable, your job is noble, and I thank you for your service that you do every single day. So, as we continue and we talk about where we want to be as a country, it is a great responsibility. It's not just going to police. And I say that to Charlotte. We talked about, Chief, what are you going to do about juvenile crime? I said, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So what are you doing about it? What are you, where are you going to help in your community to make it stronger and to make it better? Because I, when I look at it, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department arrested over 3,000 juveniles last year. 3,000. Wow. 1,700 of those kids were repeat offenders. I mean, we, we came in contact with them constantly. We had some kids that we arrested 13, 14, 15 times in one year. Mm. One year. How do you even have time? I look back when I was walking around in the streets of Jefferson City at 13, 14, 15 years old. I don't think I even knew what a gun was. I don't, I don't have any reason. I, I can't imagine they feel like I have a reason to carry a gun. And now we run into that every single day. And where are we put in our minds of our young people that at 13, 14 years old, 12, even younger than that, that I need to carry a gun. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to work on in our society. I know in our city, in Charlotte, I tell people we have to work on that. We have to figure out why that is the norm now. And how do we reverse it? And we will reverse it because if we give up, we're talking about our future. If we don't invest in our future right now, we're going to pay a bigger price later. Amen. Amen. And we have to continue to push that message. And we will. I refuse to give up on our young people. Amen. I refuse to sit and say, well, this is just the new norm. This is how it's going to be. Because it's not how it's going to be. As long as I have some say and as long as I can have a voice and be a voice, I'll continue to be that voice and advocate it's called tough love. Where do we lose yeah. tough love yeah. over the course of time? Where we say, this is not us doing something to you, it's doing something for you. It might seem like it's something you don't like, but think about if we break that cycle, if we can break that cycle of a young man, we're not just saving that young man. Like I said, it's bigger than us, right? Mm -hmm. We're breaking the cycle of that young man committing crimes. <coughs> getting into the system and then maybe we're breaking the cycle of that young man's children and the children's children and we're going to have productive citizens from here on out so we're saving lives every single day when you reach out and you save one child at a time then you're saving our future Yes. and I think that's important Amen. but I don't know how much time I have but I'm going to uh, I'm going to wrap it up and just let you know that uh, one, that I get the honor and when I get to go around and speak across the country and talk to different uh, agencies and organizations and I get to be able to say that, introduce myself and say I'm from a small town called Jefferson City, Tennessee. Amen. Amen. And I say that with pride. Because as I look back at my history and everything that I came through, I could not have asked for a better upbringing than to be here in Jefferson City, Tennessee, and just recognize the families that we have, the, the, the fellowships that we have, and the lifelong friends that I've made to this day uh, that come right here from this hometown. And I can appreciate that. And that's what made me who I am today. So as I close, I want to let you know that I appreciate you. 
I appreciate this town. I appreciate the profession of law enforcement. And I appreciate the concept of family, which is what you get here. Every time I come home, I tell people it's, yeah, Charlotte's so big and it's a hustle and bustle city. And I come home and it's like everything slows down for me. Yes. And that's where I take care of myself. So again, uh, uh, Deacon Langston, thank you. When you asked me to one day a while back and said that he'd like to have me come and speak, I got excited about it. I said, yeah, this, this is fantastic. I'd love to come back, especially come back to my hometown to be able to do it. Reverend Jones, thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here uh, and, and to come and speak and say a few words. So I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone.
yeah. could not see, but somehow we met Jesus for ourselves and he turned us around. Yeah. We need to be inspiring people. We need to take time to listen more than we do talk. We need to understand that if we can just love on one another. Can I tell you a story? It was a man who loved everybody, but not everybody loved him. Come they would on. talk about him, they would make fun of him, they would spit on him, they would do all kind of pretty things to him. But that same man had all kind of power in his hand. When it came to building a table, he could build one. Man, if he had to be a doctor, he could open up blind eyes. Oh, here he is. This is the kind of this is the kind of man I'm talking about. This man didn't see anybody. He said, "I saw us all." And the same people that messed with him, they man, even at his darkest hour when he was hanging on an old rugged cross, he had enough nerve inside of him to say, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." I don't know, but somebody said one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I knew it was the blood for me. How did you know it was the blood for me? Because when he hung up there on Friday, man, he gave up the ghost. Somebody said they took him to a bar with food. He laid there all night long. All right. All night long Friday, he was still in there. All hope was gone. But guess what? By surprise, early Sunday morning, he got up with all the power in the hand. I don't know what you have to do, but I'm going to tell somebody that I'm not going to say to anybody. His name is Jesus. Amen. Are y'all excited about it? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus has got a head of protection around me. Every choice you made, I heard that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. Amen. If you want your steps ordered, you ought to stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet right now. I need somebody to understand something. When you come to the house of the Lord, you get reverence into the Lord. We thank God for being Jesus. Amen? Amen. We thank God for Him saving our souls. But if there's somebody under the sound of my voice that don't know Jesus for them saved, well, let me warn right now. Come down here right now and get to know Jesus for yourself on this day. This is the day that he has made. Yes. yes. Will there be one? If you'd like to become a member of Martin Davis, you may come to a letter, candidate for baptism, or Christian experience. Will there be one? If you need prayer, come on, let's pray. Come on, anybody.
Say amen to me. Amen. amen. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to the Brotherhood, to the pastor, and the members of Martha Davis Baptist Church. I'm not a stranger here. I've been here before. Yes. Right. I was mayor of Terry City for 12 years, and I got demoted to the county mayor. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Terrence C., just being here. So, Chief, uh, as we're proud of you as being from Terrence City and Terrence uh, County. And not a whole lot, but we have a have a key uh, Terrence uh, County seal. We'd like you to keep that. When you, think, when you look at that, we want you to take it home and know that we're praying for you. We support you. That's what that seal means to us. Thank you. So, I, you, you talk about law enforcement, and hey, you gave me a little bit of liberty here. Not much. Ed and I were neighbors for 20 years, and he ran me off. <laughs> so, uh, I've been paramedic for 30 years, 25 years in this county. My son-in-law is a police chief. My wife's an EMT respiratory therapist. Both of my sons are EMTs. They have other careers. So I know about law enforcement. I've, I've, I've argued with them. I've worked with them. <laughs> we work together. You know how that works. You know, I've been on the scene. Who's in charge? <laughs> so, my oldest grandson was on the sheriff's department in Spirit County. He quit and went to Old Dominion because he couldn't make his bills money. Couldn't imagine that, you know, on that salary. So, he went to Old Dominion, making more money. And this week he called me, he said, Hi, Paul. He said, I just hired him in the Newport Police Department. All right. So, so, so yeah. <laughs> As a grandfather, and this might be the mayor in instead of the public sector, I said, are you making more money? Because <laughs> you couldn't pay your bills before, and I know what they cut, you know, when, it, when that happens. And he said, no, I'm making less money. I said, so you're going to make less money in Newport and get shot at. He said, yeah. <laughs> you didn't score well in school, did you? So here's what he said. And, and this, this, you know, God works in, in, in his way. Right. Yes, this, sir. This week, and I asked him, I said, well, why, why do you want to do that? He said, I'm, I'm tired of serving boxes at Old Dominion, and I want to serve people. Right. Amen. 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 So, when you talk today, you make me think of a 24 year old kid who you know, really don't know what he's doing, playing those boxes. So, just, just to honor you today, this is a proclamation. And it says, whereas Chief John Jennings of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, Charlotte, North Carolina, was sworn into office July 1st, 2020, after joining the department in May of 1992. Chief Jennings, a native of Jefferson City, Tennessee, a Jefferson County High School graduate of 1986, and talented member of the football team received a four-year scholarship at Appalachian State University and is a 2010 inductee into the Appalachian State University Hall of Fame. Whereas Chief Jennings obtained a BS in criminal justice from Appalachian State, a master's degree in business administration from Byford University, a graduate of the FBI National Academy, Senior Management Institute for Police, and the FBI National Executive Institute. Some of Chief Jean's noteworthy career achievements include, but not limited to, developing and implementing the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department's paid college internship to assist with recruitment and retention. Chief Jean's was awarded the 2021 Law Enforcement Torch Run Chief of the Year Award presented by the Special Olympics. Chief Jean's currently serves on the Executive Force for the Major Cities Chiefs Association and Police Executive Research Forum. He has served as the President of the North Carolina Police Executive Association and as the Vice President of the Charlotte Regional National Organization for Black Law Enforcement Executives. Whereas Chief Jeans is admired, respected, and loved by family and friends, and is worthy of special recognition and appreciation for dedicated service to God and others. Now therefore, I mark Ponce by virtue of the authority based on me as Mayor of Jefferson County, do hereby invite all citizens of Jefferson County, Tennessee to join me in celebration and proclaim March 10th, 24, as Police Chief John Jim Day in Jefferson County. Amen. Wow. Yeah. Yeah.
Police Chief Johnny Jennings Day. How about that? <laughs> I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna have to, next time I see the president, I'm gonna have to tell him that I have a day in Jefferson City. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's been an absolute blessing for me to again to come back full circle, speak in this church. Uh, it's just been an amazing day. And again, like I've said, today I'm where I'm supposed to be, right? Amen. <laughs> Reverend Joe. 
Jones, and he is Chief uh, Chief Jennings. Reverend Jones is where he's supposed to be. Yes. Yeah. God yeah. sent him there. Yeah. We had a struggle, but God sent who he wanted to shepherd this house. Yeah. And this house is Martha Davis Baptist Church, yes. where our church doors are always open, and everyone is welcome. And now I turn it back over to Reverend Jones. Amen. Amen.